Our final award of the evening is the legendary leader. Please welcome to the stage Bill Rue of GE Digital to present this award. Bill? Thank you, Jeffrey. So I'm pretty stoked to give out the legendary leader award. This is about inspirational leadership that allows organizations and people to innovate and create beyond their abilities. The winner today embodies the three key attributes the Churchill Club has asked in the nominee. They want someone who can see the future, look around corners, envision it. They want someone who has created leading market products and services that have changed the world. Lastly, they want someone who's created organization and talent that's built to last. Today's winner, oh, by the way, joined a $70 million company and took it to $47 billion. You know, I, I was fortunate, and I'm so excited to do this, to work for this individual for eight years during a very formative part of my career. I learned so much from this individual, and it allowed me to go to GE and help to transform this company. I can remember a lot of things he said. One of my favorite was uh, that, uh, you know, is uh, by the time it's obvious, it's too late. That's a pretty profound statement. The last thing on a personal note, to just give you a feel, of, many people feel this way about this individual. It's not just about leading a company, but the kind of person he is. And just to give you a personal touch to this, last week, and this happens to me all the time. Last week, I happened to be at the American Cancer Society benefit, and uh, I was talking to the CEO of a, of a startup. And, and I said, I, work for, I used to work for Cisco, and the person did what a lot of people do. Oh, my God, I, you know, I know John Chambers, and I love this guy. And he went on to tell me a story about m mentoring and guidance that John has gone out of the way to give. And he said, I've been successful because of this. And I've got to tell you, every time I mention this anywhere around the world, these are the stories I hear about this individual. I'm really proud today and honored to give the Legendary Leader Award to the executive chairman and the former CEO of Cisco Systems. Come on up here, John. We all do it together. Yeah, hang on just a second. Let me put it back in there in the back. Got it? Okay. Okay. Bill, thank, thank you. Thank you, John. It's an honor. This is for you. How did you ever get away from me? <laughs> you know, it's never too late to change your mind. Hey, he's on a mission. He's on a mission. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Spread the word. Spread the talent. Mm -hmm. Well, so it, it's my pleasure to have this interview, and, and, and John and I have known each other for, for a long time. Um, when we think about leadership, I think Bill kind of called out the three elements, and I'm going to sort of structure our conversation around it. And the first one is... You know, when, when we're in the middle of, of cataclysmic change, getting oriented and trying to understand and see what's going on is a very big deal. When I first met John in the 90s, it was the Internet. And people literally would fly American Airlines jets from all over the world to San Jose to call on Cisco to get a, a point of view. Twenty years later, I would say that the word now is digital. That, that, that Everybody gets that digital is that. Talk a little bit about your vision for digital and how you see that. And you, I know you talk to people all around the world about it. What are you seeing and, and what's, what's your vision there? And, Jeffrey, what I'll try to do is put my comments in a way that if you take one point away from tonight that changes how you think about your business or what you do in the future, I've accomplished my goal. And if you agree with everything I say, I failed miserably because I want to challenge this a little bit. And I think you're, you're a product of what you learn over time. I worked for IBM. We missed the transition to the mini computer and beyond. Worked for Wang. Missed the transition to the Internet. And so when I saw the opportunity uh, in the Internet, and we said in the early 90s that Cisco and the Internet was going to change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays, everybody said, nice marketing, not a chance. But we quickly realized that this was an equalizer in life along with education. And while it wasn't going to equalize all the people in the world, it could dramatically change business first and then a lot of the world's population. And I think President Clinton, even though I'm a moderate Republican, he got it during the 90s, the transition that needed to be made. And he created during the eight years of his administration, and we were on stage in the White House with him when we announced the Internet air, and I was scared to death, and, and uh, he was kind enough to let us be the business speaker at that. He created 22.5 million jobs in eight years. Uh, if you can imagine, 18 percent growth in GDP. Uh, the median income went up 30 
I'm sorry, 22%. What you're about to see with digitization, it will be more powerful than that by three to five fold. Uh, it literally will move from 1,000 things connected to the Internet to 15 billion today to 500 billion in 15 years. Power of a network, number of units squared. And it will transform every country, every company, every business, every individual, every house, every car in ways that we're just beginning to imagine and largely for the better. So you'll see in India set a goal of 1.3 billion people dramatically increasing their per capita income per household changing dramatically with Modi's leadership there, generating a million jobs a month, becoming a startup country, a startup direction. And you will suddenly see a France, which all of us would go to visit, a nice place to visit, have dinner, a nice tourist spot, become the startup nation in Europe. When we said that two years ago, people thought we were crazy. France, socialistic leadership, guess what was the number one country in Europe in the first half of this year in terms of venture capital investments? Three takeaways. First, $19 trillion, 1% to 3% GDP growth of every country in the world. Secondly, there is no entitlement. 40% of the companies in this room will completely disappear, true across the U.S., true around the world. This will be disruption, where you either disrupt or you be disrupted. But third, if done right, it has the ability to raise all boats in terms of every country and job creation. So digital to me is dramatically how things are going to change. And we're just literally in the first inning of it, Jeffrey. Well, let me push it at something because we're in the middle of a really, to me, very painful political dialogue in our country right now. I think dialogue, monologue, a series of monologues. <laughs> but the point about it is it's driven a lot by the fear of digitization and, 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 a, and a, a large population that feels disenfranchised. How do you see digitalization in terms of that concern and how, what would you maybe recommend in, in terms of that concern? Well, first of all, I think we've got to outline what the opportunity is for our country. This is the startup nation. We've done it on a scale that others have not. We aren't doing it as fast as we used to, so we've got to change. I think it's very realistic over the next eight years for whichever candidate wins to set a goal of 35, I'm sorry, 25 to 30 million jobs, to challenge again for GDP growth average of 4% a year, which is doable. India is going to grow 7 to 9%, and they're well-run Regions of 50 million people like in Andhra Pradesh will go 12 to 15 percent. You've got to think like a startup. You've got to think out of box, much like Joe articulated. You've got to set out a dream that most people consider impossible and then really go after it. And so what's happening in this political environment, instead of doing what America normally does, which is outline, write that press release, uh, for me, play the chess game all the way to the end, yeah, understand yeah, all the whys yeah, in yeah. it, and don't take your first move on the chessboard you're ready to do it, we're talking about global trade, and we're talking about uh, how we protect ourselves. There is no protection from disruption. We are the only country in the world that does not have a major digitization plan. And you have countries that have traditionally not, not led suddenly partnering with business and their citizens to completely transform. The downside, however, is if a nation gets left behind, if they fail to realize that 30 to 50 percent of what people have traditionally done will be replaced by robots and artificial intelligence, and if they don't quickly change their education system, I'm not talking about STEM, I'm talking about technology skills, not over multiple decades, but in the next decades, then you will leave behind a large part of your population. That's where we have to be careful in this valley. If we're not careful, and if we don't reinvent ourselves, not only can we go to the way of 128 in Boston, which used to be the high-tech center of the world, a thousand high-tech companies, there's only one left. Or we can all of a sudden find ourselves where other industries have, where people view high-tech not as the champion of the rest of the world, but as a job destroyer. And I think we've got to come together on that pretty quickly. I do think also our nation needs to get back in the leadership role. We don't play well when we have fear. Right. Okay, so now I want to take it down a level because, okay, so those forces you described at the national level also can happen inside a single corporation. Yes. I've been spending a bunch of time with large corporations, and this, the struggle of large corporations to catch the next wave has been a, a big problem. So, so what, if, you, if you think about driving innovation, as Bill said, the first time you were at Cisco it was a $70 million company, you were riding your first big wave. Yes. But now you have to ride more than one wave, and there's forces that want to stay ah, okay. to, with the old stuff, yep. and then they want to go in the new stuff, and it creates resource allocation and political problems and, and inertia inside the company. How do you deal with that kind of issue? Well, I think that's where it's so important, and several of my colleagues tonight started with a vision and a strategy for where they want to go. 
then as a CEO, you hire the management team to implement that. You change some of the players as well. Uh, you build a strong culture, and I didn't understand how important culture was. You've got to have a culture that thrives on where you're going to go, and you communicate your vision all the time. And so as you begin to think about how you do this, you have to have the courage to say you've got to think like a startup. You've got to think exponentially. You've got to not fall in love with the product or a technology, because the best product or technology often doesn't win. It's who executes the best. And so what we did at Cisco, we looked at catching market transitions and understanding those. And each time we caught a market transition going to the Internet, routers originally, then switches, then voice, then video, then cloud, then digitization, we rode that wave to a new billion-dollar product every year in each category. And then we had the courage to say, we're going to integrate these products together, we're never going to enter market, sold that from GE, unless we give you one or two, except for the 40% market share. And we would not only write our own press release, we'd play out the game to how we get that plus some. We've done it in 16 of the 18 major products. We integrated it together. And in so doing, we pulled away from our peers. You also have to understand that you do innovation, and most companies only innovate once, and then they tweak that one product. I think you've got to think about innovation as a whole replicatable process. And when I really began to understand this, what we did that perhaps our peers really struggled with is we created a replicatable process for every segment of innovation. So for acquisitions, which I did, I had the good fortune to do 180 of them, and wow. they'll always beat you up on the wow. flip that doesn't work. Uh, but, <laughs> and that's part of leadership. But we created a, a fire replicatable phone. process a fire phone that, that allowed work. us to move with tremendous speed. Yep. And something that I start, start, thought as a young entrepreneur, I thought, process with bureaucracy, and boy, was I wrong. If you get a replicatable process for innovation, you can move at tremendous speed. I can get a call on a Thursday night, and we did, from somebody I very much respect in the Valley. They said, John, a company that you should be owning is going to be bought. Two companies have been after him for six months. You've got to get over here and see that company. And he told me the name of the company. I said, what do they do? And I trusted the person so much, it sounded interesting. I sent my head of business development over the next morning. He called me in two hours and said, John, get over here. I went over, met the CEO, understood their business, had a handshake by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We had it through both board of directors. By Monday morning, we announced a $3.2 billion acquisition. That With time is speed how did of you, innovation. How, whoa. But it's replicatable. Whoa. So and how did you do that? No, seriously. How? You build a replicatable process. Okay. You have your rules on what you do, et cetera. We did the same thing with product leadership, rules of minimum 40% market share. We're usually closer to 55 or 60. We then bring those together in architectures, and we're always customer-driven. No matter how much we fall in love with the technology, if our top customers are Shell doesn't tell us to do this, yeah. or a GE doesn't tell us to do it, we just don't do it. Now, what you're about to see is a transition that we have to make or we'll get left behind because merely doing products isn't going to have great margins in the future. It's how do you take those products, how do you take this digitization, which literally will affect every company regardless of size in the world, and how do you start focusing on outcomes? And you have to literally change your culture to do that. You've got to knock down the silos. You've got to talk about the economic benefit. And then you've got to do it at a speed that is suddenly breathtaking. As Jamie Dimon said from J.P. Morgan Chase, he said, get used to it. Silicon Valley is coming to every yeah. single industry yeah. in the world. Yeah. And you've got to either lead or you get left behind. So let me, uh, one of the things that was kind of amazing, and I mean, there are a lot of things that Cisco did that I think set new understandings. We talked a little about M&A. One of the things you're famous for is the, is the spin-in, spin-out idea. Just say a few uh, words about where that came sure. from and, and how that worked. Sure. Uh, when you look at it, uh, when we first did our first acquisition and we announced paying $92 million for a company with $10 million in revenue, my stock went down because they knew acquisitions didn't work. And long story short, that acquisition plus two other small ones generates today about $13 billion a year. So we realized we weren't going to be smarter than others. What we did was steady while other mergers and acquisitions missed, and then we developed our golden rules of thumb, starting with the customers telling us who to buy, what features had to be changed, starting with we don't acquire a company with different cultures. Because what you're acquiring when you acquire a tech company is different than if you're a financial institution. You're acquiring people and next generation product. Different cultures yeah, don't yeah. make it happen. Yeah. So we develop a replicatable process on it, and then we just move with tremendous speed. We then tried to do internal startups, and candidly, the thousand rays of light just get killed. Yeah. <laughs> and so we said, let's, let's try a concept of taking some internal people, spin them out, have them build a, a company based, we will buy back in at a predetermined number, but only based on business results. 
And we did that uh, four times each time, generated the number one product in the industry, uh, billion dollar markets remarkably quickly, average probably 50% uh, type of market share. So it's innovation with different models. Now we're trying to do what I think all of us want to see in the Valley, which is how do you do innovation with a replicatable process in each segment of your business. And we'll stay tuned to see if we make that transition. So just to close on that, spin in, was that the same team each four times? Was it the same team each time? It was time? a subset of the same, same team. team. Yeah, they so just this, knew how to do that. And it was a personal relationship you had with them, I'm sure, that was part of, I mean, they, that's a very strong relationship of trust to, yeah, to do that. Yeah, but during... 20 years as CEO, I don't think I lost five people uh, that it wasn't the right time yeah. for them to leave yeah. or we weren't going to be able to achieve their aspirations at Cisco. Uh, we're very loyal. Uh, I know every onus of every employee in the company is life-threatening, their spouse or their children. We are there for them like yeah, no one no, else. I remember. Uh, back to the corporate social responsibility that some of my colleagues tonight we worded to. Everywhere in the world, we're number one in corporate social responsibility. We're number one in market share. And if you watch, when we go into an environment, we don't go in to destroy jobs. We go in to create an ecosystem and a partnership with the countries in yeah, Europe, like yeah, a France, yeah. uh, like a India, in a very unique way. And we understand their real concerns and aspirations, such as this digital world. If 30 to 50 percent of your jobs can be done by robotics and artificial intelligence, not only do we have to change education system remarkably quickly, but even the socialistic governments in a country like France or Germany said, we know this is inevitable, right. but you have to help us retrain our workforce. And all of a sudden you see a country saying, not only how do we train you know, a million or two million a year on the internet capabilities, which is what we do at Cisco with the network academies, a country like France is saying, we need to redo our education system. We need to make it very diverse. We've got to take these concepts and not only retrain 200,000 French men and women in a couple of years, we want you to think much larger, and we want you to take it into the equivalent of junior high. If it works in junior high with a pilot of 100,000 students, take it across to all of France, then we go to India. Now, you know where I'm going with this. There is no entitlement. Yeah. Our country has to kick into high gear here. Our businesses are doing pretty well with it, but our government hasn't even articulated a vision of how to do it, much less how do we go fix the education system. We in the Valley have to come together and say it's going to be disruption. If we don't think about how we get this education so every American has a chance to participate, and we talk 10 years from now with how did the average household grow 15 to 25 percent in terms of their income, we don't want to be talking about how 30 to 50 percent of the jobs went away in an environment. We certainly don't. So last, last thing, you know, we think about leadership. When I think about leadership, I sort of think about it as a bucket brigade. People hand down lessons to us. We try yeah. to do what we can do, handing them down. As you look at either people that have handed down lessons to you or, people, or some thoughts you might want to hand down to the next generation, what comes to mind? Yeah, it's one of the things that I would encourage each of us in the audience. It's a lesson that I learned kind of by accident. Uh, I've been crowdsourcing since since I was born, yeah. and I was dyslexic, and I, I, lots of times when I'd crowdsource, I'd get ideas and then articulate it, play the chess game out, etc. And so I was constantly learning from others. Uh, ones that come to mind, uh, Jack Welch, number one and number two, not compete uh, type of approach. And uh, he also taught me a little bit of what I would articulate. You're more product of your setbacks than your successes. That's definitely true for me, how I handled dyslexia, how a teacher, Mrs. Anderson, helped me through it, and how I took a weakness wow. and made it a strength. In 2001, in the late 1990s, Jack said, John, you have a very good company. This is when we were on the border of being the most valuable company in the world. So I said, I'll bite, Jack. What does it take to have a great company? He said, a near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get it. No, yeah. In 2001, I got it. Wow. And <laughs> it was a near-death experience, yeah. which knocked us down, and Cisco could have completely disappeared, and the majority of our competitors did. Yeah. They had market cap two and a half times ours. We ended up being two and a half times theirs, but we got crushed. At the end of 2001, I got a phone call from Jack, and I went, uh-oh. I said, yes. And he said, John, you know I have a great company. I said, Jack, I'm getting the shit beat out of me. They're doubting about can we lead. Here's where we go. He said, John, no one else will tell you this, but this was your best leadership year. Oh, wow. I think each of us in this room will be more product by how we handle those setbacks than the successes. And how did you learn from it and come back? Don't do the same mistake twice, but come back with the courage. A Shimon Perez. He taught me for 15 years, and my heart is with him now at a time with his stroke, and, and I care greatly for the man. Uh, at 93 years old, he lectures to us when I have him to my house or an event about thinking like a 13-year-old, thinking out of box in terms of the direction. Realize from the beginning that leadership will be lonely for everyone else in this room. 
And you learn from everybody. You know, I was taking notes tonight, and I'll finish them out, from all four of the yeah, other yeah. Uh, word winners. You have to constantly learn. My dad taught me how to play out the game thinking 10 or 15 years ahead of time. Both of them were doctors, my dad and wow. my mom. My mom was internal medicine and psychiatry. She taught me the emotional side. Uh, my wife and my partner for 45 years uh, who is my high school sweetheart, has been amazing through the ups and the downs. And I want to just challenge us in the valley. Uh, there is no entitlement going forward. Yeah. I think That's we're going to lead in this digitization, which will have three to five times the impact of the Internet, which will grow economies one to three percent, but it will have tremendous disruption. We've got to think out of box on how we make sure that we in high tech also understand the legitimate needs of society and everyone to participate in this and think about it more like Modi does as opposed to, well, people just have to get used to this. This yeah. is part of business. It is not. And we've got to change the education system and the philosophy we go forward. Join me in thanking John Chambers. Thank you.